Well, good morning, Mountain. Well, we are one church that meets in three locations here at Mountain Road and across town in Bel Air at the Bel Air campus that meets at John Carroll School. So let's hear it for those guys over there across town. And also our Edgewood campus that meets over at the epicenter in Edgewood. So how about a shout out for them as well? Yep. And most of you are probably already aware that Luke Erickson, our Edgewood campus pastor, and his wife, Holly, are in Uganda in what has become a bit of an uphill journey of their own. Uh, they are in the process right now of adopting two boys to join their three daughters, JL, Jada, and Maya. And they have had some health challenges and some delays in the process, and they learned this week that the Ugandan government just passed a law that all adoptive parents must agree to live in Uganda for at least two years. Uh, now, the, the law has not been formally signed yet by the president, and their attorney is assuring them that either way that it should not impact their adoption, but it's not yet a certainty. Uh, and they've had some other items that they've been able to move along quickly to try and get ahead of this legislation before it officially becomes law. Uh, and they do have a court appearance scheduled for this Wednesday. And our prayer, of course, is that the judge will keep the process moving forward and that everything will fall into place uh, so that these boys uh, can come home with Luke and Holly to us as soon as possible. So uh, let's take a moment and pray for them right now. Father, this is uh, heavy news to think about. And so our hearts are a bit heavy. And we lift up our friends, Luke and Holly Erickson, and their three girls, and these two precious boys. God, with the health challenges that they have faced, we, we pray for healing and for good health for each of them. We pray for safe travel for the girls and their grandfathers as they travel back home today. And we pray for all of them as they are separated uh, from each other for a little while. Father, we pray specifically for this entire adoption process in light of the pending legislation in Uganda, we, we lift up the court date on Wednesday and that the judge and everyone involved would expedite this process and, and not hold up the adoption in any way. And Father, even if, if the pending legislation is signed into law soon, we pray that they would be able to allow to continue with the adoption, that all the logistics and the remainder of the process would go smoothly and that you would bring them, uh, the entire family, home to us soon. Father, during this time of waiting and uncertainty, would you please give each of them a deep sense of your peace that will go far beyond understanding. And we also lift up each of the 40 families who are in Uganda now awaiting to adopt children. Please give them peace and see them through this as well. And Father, our hearts ache, and we know yours does as well, for each of the two and a half million orphan children in Uganda alone. Please be a father to the fatherless, as you promise in your word, and bring each one safely and swiftly to families that can love them and raise them to know you. God, would you please continue to break our hearts for what breaks yours, so that we will be moved to be your hands and feet to help and heal a broken world. Through Christ we pray, amen. Well, for me and maybe you, uh, the snow Friday morning reminded me of growing up in East Tennessee when I would walk to school in the snow uphill both ways and barefoot, and I liked it. So how many of you have actually used that line on your kids or grandkids? Come on, show of hands, true confession. Yeah. Uh, did they buy it? No, probably not. But did you know that you can go online and there are actually scientific discussions hypothesizing how it could be possible to have the same journey be uphill one way and uphill coming back as well? You can go check it out. And it may not be physically possible, but it sure seems at times that life uh, can be uphill both ways for us, right? especially in significant seasons of our lives. And many of us have discovered that even saying yes to following after Jesus often means an uphill climb. And in the weeks leading up to Easter, we're each invited to follow Jesus on the road to the cross. And this invitation will, will mean a challenging climb that takes us to the upper room, 
where we will invest in friendships around the table that will take us to Gethsemane where we surrender to God and will take us to Golgotha where we face the call to lay down our lives in service to others. And if you were to take a pilgrimage today to the country of Israel and you wanted to walk with Jesus on the road to the cross, you would walk what is called the Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering. And it's an entirely uphill climb. Each station of the cross uh, is a little more uphill from the other. And that's just like it is when we follow after Jesus, because it's an uphill faith journey. And the question that faces each of us is, are you ready to follow all the way your Savior leads, even if it means a tough uphill climb? I'll never forget the hike that I took in Israel. It it actually was more of a climb than a hike. Uh, A few of us guys thought it would be fun, so we asked the bus driver to drop us off along the road so we could hike to the top of Arbel Cliff. And we found this path that actually turned out to be a goat or cow path, and it was much longer and steeper than we thought it was going to be. And the path was full of rocks and roots and holes and mud and cow pies, many of which were still fresh. Uh, it was tough, slow going. And then the last 50 feet of this climb was a sheer cliff with metal rungs uh, placed into it. And by that point, as I'm climbing the metal rungs, my shoes were covered with mud and poop, and I kept, my feet kept slipping off the rungs, so I'm hanging from the side of this cliff. And you may be wondering to yourself, why in the world would you do this in the first place? That's exactly what I was thinking, hanging from the cliffside. If you're thinking we must not have known how difficult this journey was going to be, you're right. So why in the world didn't we turn around? Why didn't we go back? Why didn't we quit? Well, as difficult as it was, we experienced some amazing things along the way. We explored caves that were built into the cliffside, dug out. Uh, We, you know, we got an amazing view of scenery that we would have missed if we had stayed on the road in the bus. And we also were able to share the experience together. It was, it was a hard journey. I'm, I mean, it was tough. But that small band of companions still shares a, sm- a special bond to this day. We, we took breaks where we would sit on this mountainside and we got to look out over this expanding view of the Sea of Galilee and talking and laughing about the journey that we had been on and how much that we still had to go and how far we had come. And it, it was a, just an amazing time together. At the end of the trail, nearly exhausted, we climb up the cliff face, and then at the top, we enjoyed this breathtaking view all across the Sea of Galilee. It was awesome. In a lot of ways, though, that climb uphill is a lot like our lives. When we start our journey following Christ, we don't know what the path will hold, but it's going to be a long uphill journey and it's probably going to be filled with rocks and holes and mud and piles of crap and sometimes a sheer cliff face. Because if we're brutally honest, life is often just plain hard. But the uphill journey that would be insurmountable alone somehow becomes doable together as we follow after Jesus. And the view along the journey that we have and the view from the top is breathtaking. You see, there are just some hills that you're not supposed to climb alone. That's true with mountain climbing, and it's true in the uphill journey of following Jesus. You're not meant to climb it by yourself. You need some friends. A little boy was home one day after his family had moved once again, and this was one of several moves in just a few years. And on this day, the boy was sitting on the front porch in a very melancholy mood. And his dad came by and the boy said, Dad, who do you want to be, Superman or Batman? And the dad was preoccupied with a repair project in their new home. And he said, well, son, I'm kind of busy right now. So can you ask me later? Dad, come on. I mean, who, who do you want to be, Superman or Batman? Well, all right. Okay. Okay. Superman. Superman. Why, Dad? Why would you want to be Superman? Well, I don't know, son, because he can fly, that's why. And the dad went on about his business, and the little boy persisted. Dad, aren't you going to ask me who I want to be? Now, just a little bit irritated, the dad finally complied. Okay, son, who do you want to be, Superman or Batman? 
I want to be Batman, Dad, the little boy said. That's good, son. Dad? What now, son? Aren't you going to ask me why? Okay, the father sighed. Why do you want to be Batman? I want to be Batman because Batman has a friend. I want to be Batman because Batman has a friend. And that answer stopped Dad in his tracks, and he turned around and saw that his son had tears in his eyes. And he said, son, do you need a friend? Yeah, Dad, I need a friend. I need a friend more than I need Superman. And maybe that's you today, friends. Maybe you need a friend more than you need Superman. And having friends is just how God made us. He, he made us to need and have friends. It's a significant part of his plan for our lives. When God made the world and he put his human creation into that perfect environment in the garden, even in this perfect world, he steps back and says, it's not good for people to be alone. So you need friends. I need friends. We all need true God-honoring friends. We need to do life together. In the Bible, David had Jonathan, Jesus had the disciples, the Apostle Paul had Barnabas and Timothy. We want and need friends because that's how God made us. Ecclesiastes 4, Solomon, who was the wisest man who ever lived, wrote these words and said, I observed yet another example of something meaningless under the sun. This is the case of a man who is all alone yet who works hard to gain as much wealth as he can. It is also meaningless and depressing. Two are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Even with that truth, our culture is more and more isolating away from connectedness and relationship. Robert Putnam's research shows that we sign fewer petitions, we belong to fewer organizations, we know our neighbors less, we meet with friends less frequently, and we even socialize with our families less often than before. We're meant to do life together and not do it alone. Mother Teresa once said, loneliness and the feeling of being unwanted is the most terrible poverty on earth. And one of the longest longitudinal studies ever conducted was a 75-year-long Harvard study that determined what factors contribute most to people flourishing in life. And you might be surprised to learn that the number one factor by a significant margin was relationships. They looked at every different way that you could look at a person's quality of life, and they determined that when there were re relationships were stronger, their quality of life flourished. It's a direct correlation. It's why Dietrich Bonhoeffer tells us in the book Life Together, it is easily forgotten that the fellowship of Christians is a gift of grace. It's a gift of the kingdom of God. Therefore, let him or her who has had the privilege of living a Christian life with other Christians praise God's grace from the bottom of his or her heart. Let them thank God on their knees and declare it is grace, nothing but grace, that we are allowed to live in community with Christians. Jesus knew this truth. He knew the value of relationships, and he pursued relationships and community all throughout his life and ministry. He handpicked 12 guys and then built deep relationships with them. And even within that group of 12, Jesus drew closer to three of them in particular, Peter, James, and John. Later in the book of Acts, we see this Jerusalem church growing to thousands of people, but they didn't just gather in large groups like this. In the Bible, we see them devoting themselves to relationships and meeting in homes in small groups throughout the week, sharing meals together. And as they did this, walls came down and people of different races and different genders and different economic positions, people who used to even be enemies, came together and became friends, all on a journey with Jesus. Now, where did this early church learn all of this? Why did they decide to do life like that? What was their model for it? Well, Jesus was. He was the one they were following, even after he was gone. So let's turn over to the text, Matthew 26. Matthew 26, 17 to 30, if you want to turn there. Jesus had done life with these 12 disciples for three years, and he had poured into them, and they, they had done it together. 
And he knew that they were going to face this uphill challenge of, of doing life without him, in, him present. And he didn't want them dropping out of the race when things got tough. He knew that if they were going to change the world, they couldn't be lone rangers. If they were going to be world changers, they couldn't be lone rangers. So with all this hanging over Jesus' head, all of the weight of this, knowing that he needed to continue to pour into these guys, just before he was arrested and crucified, Jesus uses a meal in an upper room to build into them once more, to strengthen their relationships and prepare them for the uphill walk that they would have before them. And we all need relationships like that in our lives because we're also on an uphill journey. And if we're going to continue to follow Jesus uphill, we will need to climb together, friends. And what Jesus modeled for them that night in the upper room are the same things that we need in our relationships today. The things that brought them close together and keep them strong, kept them strong in their journey following after Jesus are exactly what we need in our lives to walk all the way with Jesus together. So what were those things? Well, first, get connected. If you're not yet part of a small group of friends or on a serving team here at Mountain, that's your first step. Now pull out your connecting directory and, and sign up uh, form that's in there, the Love Does sheet as well. Uh, find a way to get connected through that tool or stop by the connecting corner after the service and, and we'll help you find the right connection opportunity for you. Don't do life alone because our faith journeys happen best in circles and not in rows. They happen best in circles, not in rows. So if your only experience at Mountain is here in rows, then you need to find your way to a ministry team or a group to connect with because it's not intended to be a solo journey. And as Susan mentioned on Easter, we start a great new series entitled Love Does, and that's a great time for you to get connected. So stop by the connecting corner today and do so. Second, as you journey uphill following after Jesus, there's some relational things that, to pursue that Jesus modeled for us in that upper room with his closest friends. And the first thing that he modeled for us was serving together, serving together. In verse 17, we read, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? And he replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. You see, Jesus gave them a job. He, he told them to go and prepare the Passover, to get stuff ready. I mean, this was a big celebration. It was a big deal in their culture. And working on stuff together like that has a way of pulling a team together. Then John tells us that later in this meal, Jesus modeled serving for them by getting down on his knees with a basin and towel and washing their feet. And then he challenged them and said, if he as their master could serve them in this way, then they could be servants as well. Great things happen within a group of people when they get their hands dirty and work side by side towards a common goal. Alan Hirsch describes this as communitas. Communitas, he says, is the community that is born out of an adventure or a challenge or a mission. Hirsch says that communitas is the kind of community that happens to people in pursuit of a shared vision. It involves movement, and it describes the experience of togetherness that only really happens among a group of people actually engaging a mission that's outside itself. And we see this all the time around Mountain. People connect with others as they serve together in welcome ministry or Mountain Kids or in student ministry or with worship and production or serving our community and our world outside our walls. And as they serve together, this synergistic bond develops when a group, group is on mission together. It's powerful. It's powerful. We see it on mission trips as students and adults prepare for an uphill journey on mission and then spend an intensive time together, serving together missionally. And when they return, the missional and relational bond that is forged in a team like that is dynamic. It draws us closer together and we feed off of each other through the bonding of shared service. So the second thing that Jesus modeled um, was eating together, eating together. We read in Luke 22, that when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, the same meal in the upper room. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus is saying, look, this uphill climb that's before us is so daunting. Let's make sure that we get together and let's share this meal together. I think Jesus knew that there's something powerful to sitting down for a meal with a group of people. 
I don't know why that is. I mean, why is it that eating a meal together does more for us relationally than sitting and talking with the same people over the same period of time without food? Something powerful happens when we, sh- we break bread together and share a meal together. We do this even at funerals. We always eat together afterward and we'll cry at the funeral and then we'll laugh through our tears during the meal as we celebrate and remember a life well lived. There's something healthy about it when we eat meals together. Somehow the simple act of eating together is a critically important aspect of relationship. So when you reach out to your neighbors, use food. Have a block party or a cookout and invite people together. Invite different groups of friends together for meals at your house. Eat together with friends or as families. Don't give it up because life gets busy. Keep pursuing this. Listen to each other as you're eating together and you share with each other. And I don't mean carrying your plates to the couch so you can eat while you watch television. That's not what I'm talking about, all right? And while you're eating, put your cell phones in a basket away from the table so you can interact and share the highs and lows of your day. If you do this right now, Chick-fil-A will even reward you, okay? If a family or a table at Chick-fil-A eats their meal with all their phones placed in the family challenge box, you each get free ice cream. Just not on Sundays. But how sad is it that we have to be bribed with free ice cream to get us to put our phones down and interact over a meal? Eat together with friends and family, neighbors. Eat together with your small group or as a ministry team. Many of our serving communities here at Mountain have started doing this at least quarterly because something powerful happens when we enjoy each other's company while eating together. So eat together and tell stories, share life. You'll be surprised at how much stronger your relationships are simply by eating meals together. So Jesus modeled community and relationships by serving together and by eating together. And he also modeled it by walking a hard road together. Modeled it by struggling together and grieving together and bearing burdens together. Because during this difficult night in an upper room, Jesus drops a bomb on his friends about what's ahead. In verse 21 and 22, we read, And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Can you imagine that scene? The disciples were blown away. I mean, they had done life together for three years. And to think... Who would betray Jesus? It rocked their world. Probably they would have even never suspected Judas. I mean, he was the money guy, the the one dude they thought they could trust. And now somebody's going to betray him? Wow. John 14 tells us that on this same night in the upper room, Jesus told them that he was going to be leaving, and he was going to a place that they couldn't go at this time. And the disciples were troubled and worried and filled with grief and questions. Jesus wanted them together because he needed to tell them those things. He knew those hard things would be difficult to hear, and he needed them to be together when he shared it with them. When we're going through sadness and grief and pain, there's something about it that will draw us together because we need the strength of each other. We experienced this a few weeks ago in our community when our community came together to walk through a very difficult uphill climb. We watched as deputies' wives gathered within an hour of the shootings. They gathered here on our campus to pray and support each other. And then we watched as the sheriff's department walked this difficult uphill road together. We got to see our mountain community come together and serve them and walk alongside them. We watched how law enforcement and first responders came together from all over the country to show their support. And we watched how our county came together to support each other through this time. You know, as you think back on those days, it was as moving as it was heartbreaking. When life is tough and things are hard and it's all uphill for you, God wants you to go through it with others. Because in God's plan, there are no private tears. We're supposed to do it with each other. Galatians 6.2 says, carry each other's burdens. When life is hard, walk with somebody else and let them help you carry the load. It makes a difference when friends fix meals for you or, or they pray for you or they reach out to you just to let you know that they care. 
or maybe simply to just be with you during a hard time. My friend Sandra Kerrig has been walking a difficult uphill climb as she battles cancer. And Sandra has allowed her mountain staff community to walk this journey with her. And she's also allowed some other mountain friends to help carry this burden uphill as well. Friends who will go to doctor's appointments with her and friends who will go to cancer treatments. Friends that will bring her meals and and go wig shopping with her. Friends that took her to Florida with them just a few weeks back. Such a beautiful picture of authentic community when people can share the hardest and toughest things in life, when they can carry those burdens and do it all together in the upper room with Jesus. Jesus modeled community for us by serving together and by eating together and by going down the hard road together. And he also modeled relationships and community by communing together which we're gonna do in just a moment as we share together in communion. So servers at all our campuses can go ahead and take their places. When we share together in communion each week, it's, it strengthens our relationship with Christ and it also unifies our relationships with each other. And isn't that what our world and our nation desperately need right now is the unity of Jesus? Wouldn't that be amazing? And us coming together as a church and celebrating communion is the place that reflects unity to the world. Because we join together in a time of communion that unites churches of all stripes, churches throughout history, as one church in a relationship with Christ. And just like the early Christ followers, we we take communion every week. It's central to our worship each week. It doesn't get old because I think Jesus knew that we would need a reminder of his sacrifice for us. He wanted us to have a regular reminder, a regular reminder that we're together in him. Does it get old? I mean, does it ever get old kissing your spouse or kissing your kids? No, it doesn't get old. And don't ever mistake that communion is this mountain thing. It's not a mountain thing, it's a Jesus thing. It is and always has been for Jesus and his followers. And Jesus invites everybody who follows him to share together in this simple meal. And as we reflect on it and and eat and drink, we reflect on our relationship with Jesus. And we reflect on our relationships with each other. We reflect on this difficult uphill journey in life and, and how our relationship with Jesus makes us stronger and gets us through that journey. And how our relationship with Jesus makes such a difference in our relationships and how our relationships make us stronger and able to complete this journey. You see, it was in that, on that night in that upper room during this uphill climb where Jesus changed this Passover meal to communion, to the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. On that night, he changed it for the very first time, and they celebrated this simple meal. Verse 26 of Matthew 26, we read, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And just like this sacramental use of bread and wine, friendship takes what is common and God makes it holy. Friendship like the friends that you have right here. So just as Jesus eagerly desired to eat this meal with his closest friends over 2,000 years ago, Jesus eagerly desires to eat it with you and me today. Because we're all on an uphill journey. And after we share together in this time of communion, we're going to look at one more thing that Jesus modeled for us in that upper room. As we go uh, to God and celebrate together in this time of communion, let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for leading us. Thank you for going before us. Thank you for binding us together as a body. Jesus, thank you for keeping us from falling. 
And as we follow you on this uphill journey, as we follow you through the darkest of valleys, and as we follow you along winding paths, thank you for your presence with us and for leading us all the way. Amen. The very last thing that these guys did in the upper room before they left, and they left to face a challenging world, left to face the death of the Savior, the one they had been following. The last thing that these guys did was worship through singing together. In verse 30, we read, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Hmm. Hmm. These tough guys, and they sang together as the last thing. They, they didn't do 50 push-ups and shout hoorah. They didn't dance around like Ray Lewis and shout and pump their fists and say, now let's go get them. They didn't go through special forces training. They didn't go to seminary to learn the nuances of theology. No. When these 12 guys were going to go out and face the world and carry the good news of Jesus, when these 12 guys spent their last moments with Jesus before he went to a cross, the last thing they did together was sing. They worshiped. Now, I know that worshiping through singing doesn't look all that powerful and strong, but when we do it together, it joins us into a mighty force that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. And not because of our power, but because of the powerful one that we worship. Now, I know you probably think I'm a young guy, and this is going to change your thinking. I remember a song that, was, that came out in 1979. I was in high school. It was a song by the Imperials, and the song was entitled Praise the Lord. And this song is about the unlikely and surprising power of praise on an uphill journey. Listen to these lyrics as we journey uphill. When you're up against a struggle that shatters all your dreams, when your hopes have been cruelly crushed by Satan's manifested schemes, when you feel the urge within you to submit to earthly fears, don't let the faith you're standing in seem to disappear. And instead, on the journey uphill, listen what the song says we should do. Praise the Lord. He can work through those who praise him. Praise the Lord. For our God inhabits praise. Praise the Lord. And the chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you that they drop powerless behind you when you praise him. Last month, many of us got the opportunity to worship as a part of Casey Stengel's funeral. People standing with hands raised, eyes moist, hearts full, voices strong as we praised and worshiped in a time of grieving. It was as if we were proclaiming God's power right into the face of the powers of darkness and death. When we worship together, we join with a mighty church of God that is an unstoppable force. So when, friends, when we worship together, do so with all your heart. Do so with all your voice, hands raised. Put all your energy into it. We've got to at least top what we do when we're at a Ravens game or a Terps game. At Celebrate Recovery on Friday nights, yeah. At, at CR, if you come on a Friday night and worship with the folks that gather for Celebrate Recovery, people know that they are alive and redeemed and recovering only because of the grace and power of God. And because God is delivering them and is with them on their uphill journey, they worship like nothing you have ever experienced. And you know all of those very same things are true about us? So we ought to worship like it. So worship with your whole heart, with everything that is in you. Friends, when your journey uphill is the most difficult, that's when we worship together and sing praise to our God. So that's what we're going to do right now. Would you stand with me? Psalm 34 says, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us praise his name together. Let's sing.